Welcome to The Thriving Misfits, the podcast where we celebrate resilience, embrace diversity, and challenge norm. I am your host, Fiona Young, and today we are thrilled to introduce Nikki, a purpose-driven change maker who believes in the power of communication to connect and collaborate with people for people. Nikki is a former PR director with over 10 years of experience in strategic branding and communication, currently making waves as a DEI consultant. Now, she is passionate about advocating for LGBTQ+, economic empowerment, inclusive work places and transgender professional leadership. Nikki works tirelessly on both national and also international stages to create lasting impact for underrepresented groups. Nikki used to serve as the regional representative of Tourism Malaysia and the Ministry of Tourism and Creative Economy Indonesia, taking care of the Thailand and Indochina market. Nikki is also a sought-after lecturer and speaker on topics including tourism management, communication, LGBTQ plus issues, and intercultural dynamics. So join us as we delve into the inspiring journey of Nikki, exploring her purpose for connecting people and her mission to create a truly inclusive and sustainable workforce. Welcome, Nikki. Hi, Sadiqa, everyone. I'm Nikki Pinyapinsha from Thailand. Thanks so much, Fiona, for having me for this podcast. Thank you. Absolutely. When I heard your name and I saw your profile, I just thought I need to bring you on board as a guest because you are so unique. You're so beautiful. And all the things that you're doing to empower misfits, right, um, in the world, is just amazing. And we want to know more about what you're doing. So, Let's kick it off with some rapid fire round questions. So if you could assign any famous LGBTQ plus celebrity as your PR assistant for a day, who would it be? And what outrageous campaign idea would you pitch together? Oh my God, that's a very funny question. And I, you know, as a PR myself, I never, you know, uh, get that kind of assistant Um you know, in terms of, oh, how we can get that big name of the people to come and work for us, by the way. But I mean, if I would choose, I think I would pick Lavery Cox. I think she's the one who's, uh, you know, um, really, really, you know, um, voices, you know, on this kind of, you know, trying to do people and also the LGBTQ advocate. You know why? Because I think she's the first, you know, um, transgender, like openly transgender actress. And that, you know, all her baby doll, um, baby doll are the first, you know, um, person, and I think that kind of um, the mass, um, let's say, um, PR and initiative that really make people understand that actually trans the people they not really uh, need to be you know um, fit into that let's say stereotype or you know beauty norm or beauty standard that make people just think okay we need to look so feminine um, because in the end you know gender identity is not defined by your own appearance but also I think the way that we think the way we behave the way that we see ourselves as a female it doesn't mean that you must be you know fit into that norm and I think that if you could have the rubber doll you know in different kind of like body size um, color skin and the way that we put the face is really you know you don't need to be um, let's say submitted feminitization, like facing that way, I think we can understand, oh, this is a tool uh, of how uh, people are so diverse and different in terms of the appearance and the way they think about themselves. I think uh, she would, you know, really help me on that too. And then um, in the end, all the kids and all the younger generation will see that actually when they see that face in that Barbie doll, oh, they understand, wow, this is a world that they can fit in themselves. Oh, yeah. I loved her performance in Barbie. And she's just such a beautiful person inside and outside. Right. And yeah, I think she would make an amazing PR assistant for you. Now, what is the... They for her then. <laughs> <laughs> you never know. Now, what's the quirkiest, what's the funniest piece of advice you have ever given or received about navigating DEI in the workplace? So I think people um, just, okay, let's do something. Let's do activities, let's do a talk, let's do um, events, let's do campaign, like PR. And I think and 
what I mean, the, the outcome of that activity is comes with, okay, you get image, you get awareness. But sorry, like for EEI, we talk about impact. And I think um, trying to shift um, from image to impact, it's not easy for sure. It's a long-term investment. It's the way that you should start with not what, but you should start with why. I think that's the first question I'm trying to um, even, you know, educate my clients and educate myself to Oftentimes, what we do, we never thought about why we are doing this. I think that's the first question we need to ask and reflect ourselves. When you can address that why you are doing this, because of, of course, you see, you know, the inequality, you see the systemic barriers that, you know, limit the opportunity for these, you know, marginalized people to get access into this space, to get access into inclusive space where they want to be part of that. And I think when you get the why on you are doing this, even especially in the company, right? You always start with your purpose. So why you are doing this? But once you know you have that vision and you have that strategy, and then you can turn that you know high level of why into let's say operational level, like how to do and what to do, all the things that you could do. Because in the end, we can't come up with a solution without knowing what uh, the issue or challenges or the problem that you are having to tackle and why you need DNA in your company. Because some company like you have your own nature of inclusivity, but you never thought of, wow, that's called inclusive already, right? So I think it could be the why first and then you will see how and what you're going to do next. I love that. And it sounds to me that you are applying the golden circle by Simon Sinek because it's, yes, yes. He talks about start with why, right? And this is always what I also advocate for, no matter whether it's DEI or even your personal life, you need to understand, right? You need to understand your purpose and then the how and the what will eventually evolve but I, I hear you. What I see a lot, not a lot, but what I see some companies are doing is that they want to jump on that bandwagon where they want to embrace DEI with running campaigns, with having initiatives. But it's it looks quite ingenuine. It's not very authentic because they think that they need to do it because of marketing purposes, because of employer branding. But I think when the organization and especially the senior leaders, they are genuine about embracing DEI, creating that sense of belonging in the workplace. Then everyone feels in the workplace, everyone feels that they can be part of it, that they also play a role. Because essentially, I think you and I agree that DEI is not just something that senior leaders or HR have a role to play in, but everyone has in all levels of the organization. 100%. Yeah. Now, your identity, your background is quite fascinating. Very, very interesting. So you grew up in Thailand. Um, were there any particular events or influences that shaped your understanding and also advocacy for DEI, especially in the LGBTQ plus space? Hmm. Well, if I could, you know, um, track back on my life journey at why I'm doing what I'm doing today. I think, you know, coming from the very, let's say, low socioeconomic background, um, I really um, worked very hard in that time because, you know, uh, to support the family and help family to, like, sell the food in the food stores. And, you know, one day when I was, like, you know, I'm watching all the dishes that the, the customer just, like, ate, and I just, you know, has that curiosity. Um, like similar to myself, um, Nikki, are you still like want to do this for the whole life or what is next? What is the journey that you can do and what is the journey that you want to pursue rather than just sitting here, live on daily life basis, like earn for daily life basis and, and that's kind of stuff happening because it's very hard, you know, my, my, my childhood on, um, Rather than just being able to, you know, do a lot of things, have fun, but, you know, it was very tough um, trying to, you know, support a family. So when that curiosity or question, you know, triggers, you know, my, um, trigger myself. So I 
thought, okay, first of all, I think I should do my own business and do things that I can earn more rather than just be an you know employer in and that time. I think that kind of you know little question and little reflection about yourself really trigger you um, to become who you are today. If you know exactly what you really want, and then during the time rather than I'm um, trying to fit in the you know stereotype in the trials to the people who normally go to beauty pageants or work mm. in that you know a makeup artist in this kind of beauty media or entertainment industry or even you know in the sex industry all this kind of under exploited or underpaid job um, it comes to you know um shape your future i didn't want that to i mean i didn't want it to allow you know myself to 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 be in that way but don't get me wrong i respect all the job but i think I want to see myself, you know, challenge myself to be in other job sector, for example, like business owner or professional, um, you know, um, setting. So, and that, you know, curiosity showed me um, my journey of becoming, you know, um, a professional um, worker in, you know, corporate sectors. And then it really um, changed my life, you know. And then after that, I really pursue on this career, try to building up, you know, my own space in the career setting. And, you know, a lot of discrimination and harassment happening through my life. And I, of course, I didn't want to you know, go into, deep into detail, but of course, as a, you can imagine, as a trans, there are people um, who has different um, experiences, background, and then got this kind of, let's say, limited opportunities to thrive for own um, space and career. But in the end, you know, with that kind of um, curiosity, resilience um, about things that come to my life, but I choose how to react them with, you know, empathy and resilience. And then I trying to make difference, right? Because in the end, you never know what your journey in life would be until you try. Mm. And you're trying to connect the dot of what you have experience and how you can make life better so in the end you know being transgender people um in this society even though it seems like oh china is so welcoming but in reality it's different and the society still like look at you in different way um it's not what you expected but mm -hmm. yeah with that quality um that has practices from a lot of this um life so make me become like who I want to be and then and the best thing is that for now I can really have the resources to help people to grow um, those who see their life like not like me but in this I mean in this journey together that's why we, we're building up this you know a network of people with the same mindset well, that's really great. And to learn from your background and, you know, now helping others to also feel empowered. How was it? You mentioned just now that people have this perception of Thailand being so welcoming to transgender individuals, um, but it's actually not the reality. So how was it for you when you how old were you when you first noticed that, you know, you might be transgender? How was that experience for you to even share that with your family members, your friends? Well, that's a very good question. You know, like coming out, I think is another privilege as well. If you are able to come in your house, to your family, okay, that's so good privilege. But I apologize that I, I, I didn't have that privilege. I didn't like, you know, um, out to my family yet even. But, you know, in this, you know, society, even my family, um, we are not taught to be able to, um, let's say, have a safe conversation together. And I think that depends on the family. But my family, we hadn't, you know, had that yet. Uh, even, you know, in the past few, um, like 15 years back, for example, um, when I realized that, okay, I, I really um, want to, you know, um, to live my life as, for example, a female. Right, so very long hair, do make up and dress like a female. Um, I just started, like, I think, 15 years old when mm -hmm. I turned um, that mindset of, okay, I want to be feminine, so how would I do? 
I start checking homeward without any, you know, um, successes from my family, without knowing, you know, without them knowing that, okay, I was checking homeward because I have friends at the school, um, um, like, you know, where we learn from each other, okay, how to take homeward, which is, of course, not a very good example, you know, because this is quite risky for your health. But, you know, with that, um, ambitious you know to become a female so i was just like okay try it whatever i've been passed with a lot of let's say unconventional um uh uh let's say taking hormone and, and that kind of learning how to be female because we didn't have that kind of role model and mm. you know the friends in so called where they can give a very you know practical and, and making sense advices so you know if it's in yourself and the family was not really open for 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 me into that space, so I trying to like when you go back home, I hide myself. I didn't get a chance to to talk to them. But when at school, you have friends, so we can be whoever. But again, in the school, teachers also like really didn't um, accept us that much, and they didn't really help us that much. So we we kind of like sometimes we hide, sometimes we open. So that's why it's kind of like. On and off, you know, in that journey. So, and up until now, I even didn't have a chance to like speak clearly with the family of okay, I, I, who I am and, and, and why I want this one. But again, I'm living together with that kind of society in the family. So I just like I'm starting, you know, to become who I am, dressing up, uh, making up, and. And I think this way, a particular way of how I shape my life on my own thing, I prove the family that yes, I being in this body, in this um, gender identity, but I can still earn love life, have the quality of life, and not really doing bad things to other people. So I think the level of acceptance is not start is not communicated, you know, out loud or clearly, but they just see and notice and then it's just like open mind to me so in the end i think because of i really now support my family on my own so i can really you know prove that okay i can do things i can do fun mm, that kind of barrier so yeah great it's uh it's interesting to see that your family has somewhat indirectly accepted you for who you are without yeah. talking about it right yeah. Okay. Now you mentioned you didn't have many role models when you grew up, when you found out that you might identify more as female and that you, you identify as a transgender. Uh, I see you now being such a great role model for, you know, young individuals who may want to transition. And you also set up the company called Trans Talents. So can you share a success story from your work at Trans Talents, um, you as a DEI consultant, that also led to significant positive changes within a client's organization? Oh, thank you so much. A very good question as well for me to this thing. You know, I think, as I mentioned earlier, I have that curiosity, right? So what I can do differently um, how my life could be, you know, different places from what I was, you know, that time. So have that endeavor of, you know, doing business, um, to have more financial freedom and to have my uh, freedom of choice on, on, on how to choose who you are, you know, being in this uh, transgender, you know, identity and to get that success is quite a big challenge to my life. And then, Again, you have a dream, but dream without action. I think it's just a dream or it's just a word, right? So I think you should take the action and then um, pave your way uh, towards that journey. And of course, you need to have a lot of these resources, network of tools um, to help you to grow as well. I think that's very important. And again, if I would retell uh, the success story, I think it's quite, um, I want even just um, to remind myself, you know, to have that success is come with different failures, disappointments, disputes, and all of that, you know, um, limited, you know, uh, opportunities that really, really, really teach you um, um, to have a clarity and goals for what you want to do. 
I don't know about success, to be honest. I just want to have that clarity. And then I have all the goals that I need to success. I think that's very important for me. I set the goals of what, you know, my business, like child's talents as a consultant, you know, we want to achieve. Of course, our mission is to, you know, to help organizations to transform the way they think about inclusivity and the way they think about diversity. It's not just about having that um, different people um, into your organization, right? I think in the end, it's just kind of like tokenism because it's just having that people without understanding who they are, what they need, and how you can empower them to become part of that driving trend to your organization. So having inclusion culture in your company is one of the very key elements of how we create the diversity, equity, inclusion for the organization, right? So having diverse people coming in and have that inclusive and safe space for them to become not only who you are, but to become your, let's say, foundation of growth to your business organization. I think that's the key um, mission we want to achieve. And so far, um, we have helped, you know, more than, I think, like 10, because my business is like a year. And then we have helped more than 20 businesses um, on how to make more inclusive policy. And I have trained more than, I think, 1,000 hours already on diversity inclusion in different topics that um, cater or customize to the organization vision and, and the way that they see themselves. You know, we've written different things like unconscious bias, everyday inclusion, how to create a fearless organization, or building up psychological safety, and how to make the inclusive hiring and inclusive leadership. So different topics we cover based on the client, you know, needs and priority. And I think another milestone we, that we achieve is that we, because I think in the end of the day, we're trying to work with organization to open door, you know, for mm. the you know, untapped talents to get into that kind of society, to perform, um, and then to try, you know, as a, you know, young generation of leaders in organization. In the same time, we need to empower other community as well, because, you know, um, at, and for now, I have created a, a network of growth that I always mention, network of growth. I think it's very important um, to have that LGBTQ professionals network. I don't think we have never had that kind of, um, let's say, professional gathering together uh, to become network right? because we are everyone just have their own advocacy their own background and mm. but in the end when i gather these people now we have early 50 people you know into that kind of gathering and then we share all the challenges and we share resources and then it's like you know those who can recommend jobs for these people those who can really come up with initiative right you know um, yeah whatever events, campaign, and even for now, we gather all this professional network to do the first um, Pride Economic Forum in Thailand um, because we in the end, we really um, want people to understand that well, having you uh, as part of the society is not just about social work and make it on legal perspective and have human rights basis, but also we need to have let's say economic empowerment or where you really have the freedom in terms of finance, investment, and living choice, you know? And mm. having that better quality of life is very important for us to, to let's say, not only have um, human, basic, uh, human rights basis, but also um, the life that you want to live. I think that that's uh, the mission we, we are trying to to shape that way now, but so far it's so happy to have these people allow and, and making change together in a different way. Oh yeah, I think that's great to have all these masterminds together and really we're stronger together if we join forces, right? Mm -hmm. So now Nikki, we have a lot of folks who join us on this podcast and they feel that they don't quite belong, whether in society, whether in the workplace, they feel like a misfit. Now. Mm -hmm. As a misfit, maybe we then tend to complain that we are not being included, that we are different. People don't want to associate with us. But how can we empower ourselves if we feel that we don't belong? How can we create 
a more inclusive and supportive culture? Mm. So I would um, say in two different perspectives. First of all, if you ask about how we ourselves, for example, like LGBTQ people or non-LGBTQ people, you don't feel belong to yourself, right? I think that's the first question. Um, oftentimes, we always think like we are not good enough. We shouldn't be in this body. Um, we are like imposter syndrome somehow, you know. I think it, it really differs from, you know, level of of understanding yourself and and level of acceptance and confidence as well. So I think in the end of the day, if you don't know who you are, what you want, you need to have that um, session with yourself to have that clarity. Again, I always come with the clarity. If you don't have that clarity in your life, in who you are and what you do, I think that's a challenge for you to even go further in terms of acceptance and, and feel belonging kind of that stuff, you know? I think mm. to understand like who you are at the first day. And you don't need to be a copycat, you know, for, to the other people. Like being a trans mm. and you don't need to be just like, oh, have that possible beauty, you know? You don't need to have that kind of, um, that body, that look, that appearance. I think in the end, people just think about you or perceive about you. I think first impression is one thing, right? To have that kind of you know, beauty, faith, and, and, and the way that you form yourself. But in the end, the way you treat people, I think that make people more remember about you, right? Because if you don't treat people well, the way you interact with them, I think they, in the end, beauty doesn't really help. So mm. come back to yourself, like have that quality on you, and then you know who you are now and what you are doing now and how you help other people. I think trying to, apart from getting it, but giving it to other people, that's the way you really, you know, make a connection with other people and make a connection to yourself that, well, you have that power within you to give the people, to make a change, and, and then into that level, that applies to how this to the second question, how organization really uh, empower people, you know, to really make people feel belong. I think when you make people feel belong, because what? It's not just about you just talk that, okay, let's be, let's feel belong. No, we never mm. use have in training, right? But how to make people feel like I mentioned earlier, you know, how you can give people, uh, listen to people, get them speak and listen to what they need and, you know, what the organization can support. I think now say organization trying to be, okay, um, let's say purpose within organization or social impact um, within organization without thinking, well, you can grow your profit um, as a business, but again, um, you need to think about people as well because they are the ones who are, are behind and taking care of your business. If you take good care of your people, your people take good care of your business and profit. I think that's very simple logic. But of course, not every business owner or leaders can do that well because they just, you know, um, see things, you know, different. Black and white. Yeah, kind of thing. So, yeah, it's just really yeah. on that journey of yourself and being yourself like unapologetically yeah. is very important thing. Mm. Uh, that's amazing, Nikki. I think that's so important that we take a step back and just really find that clarity, who we are, what our purpose is in life. You know, not only companies need to have their purpose, but especially us individuals too. And I think if we feel like a misfit, maybe there's an opportunity for us to share our vulnerability, why we feel like a misfit and share that with others. As you said, this is, can be such a force, in fact, to support others because then they're not alone and we're not alone at times when we feel like we don't belong. So thank you so much, Nikki, for sharing all these insightful experiences. So as we wrap up today's episode, we extend our heartfelt thanks to Nikki for sharing her inspiring journey and invaluable insights with us. Nikki's dedication to promoting diversity, equity and inclusion, particularly in the LGBTQ plus community, 
highlights the importance of creating inclusive environments where everyone can really thrive. We hope Nikki's messages have resonated with you and provided encouragement for anyone who may feel like a misfit. Remember, embracing your unique identity and advocating for inclusion can lead to powerful and positive change. Whether you're navigating the workplace, the community, or just live in general, know that your differences are your strengths. So thank you once again for tuning in to the Thriving Misfits podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe on Spotify, YouTube, or Apple Podcasts, and remember to leave a review. Stay tuned for more inspiring stories and insightful conversations. Until the next time, keep thriving, Misfits.